Greetings, podcast listeners, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Dr. K, and I'm here with Dr. Shea. And welcome. Welcome to the second episode of The Doctor's Corner. Dr. Shea and I will select different books from a variety of genres and discuss in 30-minute podcast sessions. Just 30 minutes, you guys. Offering our subjective evaluation of the literature with hopes of helping you determine if this compilation will be a five-star compelling read, a three-star average read, or a one-star less than compelling read. Remember, a quality literature review is not about the author, with the exception of biopics, memoirs, or biographies. Traditionally, our focus is on the content, the writing, the navigation of the topic, the characters, the storyline, the research, and on the facts. Just in case this is your first experience with The Doctor's Corner, we will share just a little bit about ourselves. Dr. Shea, you want to start? Hello, listeners. It is my pleasure to be here with you again. I am Dr. Sabrina Hanna. I am a Navy veteran. I received a doctorate in education with an emphasis in organizational leadership from Argosy University. I'm very excited about this second literature review that we're going to do for you today. And Tina... Let's hear a little bit about you. A little bit about me. Okay. I am a proud United States Navy veteran, and I, too, hold a doctor's degree. It's in business with an emphasis in human resource management from Walden University. I enjoy reading, writing, and arithmetic. Okay, okay, okay. I do enjoy reading. I love listening to spoken word. That's enough about me. Let's go ahead and get started with today's literature review. So keep in mind, guys. The genre for this next literature review is the same as that of episode one, Call to Rise, by David O. Brown. If you haven't had an opportunity to listen, you can do so by finding us at The Doctor's Corner on Stitcher, YouTube, Podcasts, and iTunes. Our literary topic is titled Vigilance, authored by Ray Kelly, copywritten in 2016 and published by Hache Books a division of Hache Book Group of New York, New York. Background, Kelly served two stints as the New York commissioner appointed by two non-consecutive mayors, first appointed by Mayor Dinkins in 1992 at age 51 as the 37th police commissioner of the city of New York, then again by Mike Bloomberg in January 2002 at age 61, as the 41st police commissioner of New York City. New York Police Department is touted as having over 25,000 police officers with over 8.4 million diverse residents. Thank you so much for that background. So let's talk about the leadership style that was modeled by Kelly in this literature review. So Kelly acknowledged within the book that his leadership style was acquired through his military service in the Marine Corps. And so we all know that the military is primarily an authoritarian style organization. Kelly also notes that law enforcement is a top to bottom hierarchy type organization in which authoritarian style is primary as well. And one of the things he points out is that most complaints are not voiced to open management because of this style. But with Kelly, One of the things that's noted is that he also had a participative style leadership, in which case he would lean on the specialties and the expertise of others in which he was not the expert. Right. And an example of this is when he started his second term as the commissioner of New York shortly after 9-11. You know, this was a a huge spot in history for America. And it was a turning point for all of us on how we do business. And one of the things that Kelly instituted and began was a counterterrorism department at a local police department. So to do this, first of all, he had to sell this idea. So one of the things he did to sell this idea is he sought out those experts who were experts in different fields like counterterrorism, intelligence. These are some of the expertise that he would need to be able to start this new department to change the way that the PD did business as a result of now terrorism being on the forefront of one of the things that we were, you know, 
up against in this right. country now. Another thing, if if I, we think about his leadership style, is that Kelly did not shy away from making tough and unpopular decisions. Uh, eventually made, because it wasn't an easy sell, was the Freedom Center that they were going to build in place of the Twin Towers. And the original design of this tower, it was just unsafe. It was too close to the highway. Uh, it was a security concern. According to Kelly, when he was trying to talk to the powers that be, that would be like uh, Larry Silverstein, who was the Manhattan real estate developer in control of the site. Then Governor Pataki, you know, one of the major uh, players in this, that this was the placement and the construction of it. You know, right. it just was going to be a security nightmare. Um, right. They were against it. And it, it was a political thing, according to these people at this point. And he wouldn't take no for an answer. He continued to contact them, to try to talk to them, to try to tell them how this would be affected, how it would make this particular area a, a target all the time because of where it was and because of the construction. And so he can, like I said, he continued to fight, even though, you know, he had been told no several times. He'd been told no. So when he finally was able to secure a meeting with Larry Silverstein to talk about this, and that was after pushing and pushing and writing correspondence, he went and got the experts and he wrote a full written report that had a clear argument to present because he knew one of the things he's Kelly says is that this was his last chance to change the situation. So he brought in what he called a counterterrorism all star team. You know, he went and got the experts. You know, even though he was this uh, authoritarian type of person, he went and got the experts so they could speak. These experts included people like Cuffer Black and Brian Jenkins. And then he also had Lawrence Livermore, who was um, in the National Laboratory of Research and Development for National Security Science. So, so as we can see, he was authoritarian, but he knew where his strengths were and he knew when he had to reach out and get lean on the strengths of other people. So I, I feel Kelly was really gifted in understanding his strengths and leaning on the strengths of the subject matter experts, uh, reputable people who were less likely to be questioned when he was making a decision. I totally agree. I believe that his leadership style was predominantly authoritarian. And I would say maybe sprinkled like a cupcake sprinkled with a little bit of participative. <laughs> I drew this conclusion based on his writing style, like full disclosure. He had maybe three or four instances that stood out to me where he wrote imperious statements, for example, in chapter three titled on the job. He pulled up to the scene and he saw a victim's body laying on, on the ground. Without the book discussing anything further, he yelled out, get that body out of here. OK, so that's one. Then again, he explained how in 1971, 15 officers were killed in the line of duty and some of the officers anxiety manifested in unsettling ways. So an officer that was driving him came out with an M2 carbine and he wrote, Get that back in your locker. And for whatever reason, these statements he put in quotes. So it stands out to me that he's detailing quotations around something that he's saying. Get that body out of here. We got get that back in your locker. Then again, in chapter four, titled Taking Command, Kelly made some departmental changes in chapter four, citing I'm the commander and I'm in charge. And that was in response to some of the officers grumbling about the changes. So this same demeanor of leadership style also seemed present during his six months in Haiti in chapter six titled Haitian Heat. He went to Haiti to restore order and he wrote he was eager to look the lieutenant in the eye upon arrival and explain to him that with his arrival, it's a new day. So Kelly did identify everything that he learned about leadership it was from the Marine Corps, such as how to be a leader and how to deliver clear messages or how to treat other people and, and how to treat yourself. But I believe 99.9% .9 of the time he came guns blazing. Let's move on and let's talk about Kelly's decision to become a police officer. Was it a societal need or an intrinsic desire? So should I go first? Go for it. Okay. So unlike Brown, Kelly did not mention any accounts of devastation and crime-ridden neighborhoods. Kelly spoke about not wanting to be a cop. Kelly experienced 
what he terms his first law enforcement duties as when he served as a lifeguard. He talks about his adrenaline rushes as he executed these duties. Later on, Kelly talked about seeing an ad to apply as a law enforcement cadet, and he applied while he was in college. So the next experience in which he talked about this adrenaline rush was as a cadet when he worked in the 911 center. Then he moves on and he talks about his junior and senior year in college and he was in a platoon leadership course working in the Quantico Marine Base. And this was another time when he kind of got to serve in a capacity where he was, you know, instructing people. All of this kind of really speaks to his authoritarian style. And so uh, these three experiences were where he began to realize that he was fulfilled from doing things that gave him this adrenaline rush. But according to Kelly, he was still set on being a Marine. And so Kelly was accepted into the Marine Corps. And he also graduated from law enforcement uh, cadet school with the number one score, had the highest academy grade, the physical fitness and shooting score. So now he was in this conundrum where he was signed up and started the police academy. And then he also had to leave in a few months to, to begin his service in the Marines. So he did just that. He started the academy, then he had to leave and go to the Marines, then he came back and began his duties as a law enforcement officer. And so from this reading and from what I derived from this, he did not have an innate desire. He found out that he was stimulated by these adrenaline rushes through his experiences as a lifeguard, a cadet, and a Marine. I think you hit the nail on the head with that one. What degree do you think that he relied on faith in NYPD? Unlike Brown, Kelly really didn't make any references to faith and religion in his recount of experiences. In fact, Kelly's experiences does not give a moment or an event in which I feel he bared his soul or left himself exposed as it relates to his raw feelings and emotions. Having said this, this account is maybe purposely left out. Kelly seems to indicate he relies solely on what's before him, facts, science, numbers, what's taking place in a situation he's encountering. So I didn't, that doesn't mean he didn't, maybe he, you know, prayed in private and it's something he doesn't share. But from what I've read, it, you don't see any reliance on a higher power than himself and the, in the facts that's before him. Well, guess what I discovered? What? Early, early, early in the book, he said that the Kelly family was like a punch the ticket type Catholic family. And they did what was expected in the religious department. When he got old enough, he joined his brothers in slipping out of the church after communion. So throughout his memoir, Kelly didn't reference church or God or relying on any higher powers. But Veronica, Veronica actually did. She she went to a church one day, but she went um, after 9-11 and participated in a program as a flag bearer. And it's it's kind of disconcerting to me because it's like the nation tends to um, go to church when tragedies happen. Yes. It's funny you would say that because I just saw something on television on why planes crash. And one of the comments by one of the ladies on there, she said, there's no atheist on a plane when it's about to crash. Everybody's <laughs> praying. <laughs> so I, th I thought that was funny. <laughs> So, OK, so let's move on and talk about some of the foundational narratives imparted by significant persons that influence Kelly's choices, actions and career. So in reviewing the book, Kelly did not give a wealth of information to me about his family other than his father, who he said basically was a provider and he was distant emotionally. Uh, his mother, she was easygoing, need an appearance. So as if I go back and try to find maybe some people who were early in his life who uh, planted some foundational narratives, I, I really didn't have any. Uh, Kelly did mention throughout the book the need to be vigilant. And as a Marine, this is an important trait. So Kelly shares he learned all he knew about leadership from the military, and he drew from that training in performing his duties. Kelly said the traits he learned in the course stayed with him. And he could teach that today. So his brothers were in the Marines. And so they brought 
a marine guidebook home and they let him look at it as a young boy and he remembered the or he talked about the different traits that were shared in the book or so he has this military background with this uh, foundational you know guides or you know ways and how you should conduct yourself the law enforcement environment had the same thing. So from these experiences and from these backgrounds, Kelly shares some basic foundational narratives that he says are necessary for success. And they are, be regimented. There needs to be a system in place. There must be rules. There needs to be a chain of command. There should be a commitment to following directives a meeting of the mind agreed upon uh, understanding between, you know, the parties involved. So if we look at, you know, these things that he shared, if you think about that, they really all point towards authoritarian, even though, like I said, I still feel like there's a very heavy reliance on participative style as well. But these are authoritarian type statements. What say ye? Ye say that Kelly relied on Kelly, and when he needed, he would collaborate with others, as he did indicate in Chapter 4, taking command. I found not necessarily fruitful foundational narratives that he attributed to significant people in his life, but people that he admired. So he mentioned Dean Graham Allison, who he thought was thoughtful and deep and very approachable, but nothing that he said or nothing that was poured into him. He also mentioned a Mark Moore, who he declared had great insight on how to lead public agencies into a modern age, but not necessarily something he said to him that impacted him. Because of these two individuals, he stated that he learned that organizations consist of moldable human beings and that they may need encouragement and motivation. Kelly also acknowledged Commissioner Ben Ward, that he was a role model, an excellent police official, that he was self-confident in his decision making, noting that Commissioner Ward, he didn't go or look for anybody to be happy or like or be pleased by him. He didn't care if you liked him or not. Mm-hmm. Kelly stated that he admired Frank Labuti and Labuti <laughs> and trusted David Cohen. There were several other high ranking and, you know, high power figures he he recognized from the CIA and FBI. And and one particular young lady stood out for me that, you know, he made mention she was African-American and from the Smithsonian that he used to conduct a study within NYPD. But none of these people did he indicate told him anything profound that swayed his thought process, not even the close associates that told him not to endorse Bloomberg. So. I don't know about foundational narratives for Kelly. He either kept that close to the vest like he did, you know, emotions and vulnerability. But that's that's my take on it. Do you do you have any part of the book that evoked any form of great sentiment for you, Shay? Well, you know what? That was a difficult area as well. If you you remember when we talked about this with uh, Brown's book and I talked about his best friend dying and how Brown was really raw and open about how he felt. So if I reflect on that and then I start thinking about Kelly's personal accounts, there weren't many. Um, Most of the book, there were detailed accounts of events. I mean, very detailed accounts of events that happened in the professional arena, followed by very detailed accounts of the actions that were taken and the outcomes. So for me, the most riveting accounts were professional accounts, mainly the 16 foiled terror attacks. The details and information regarding the plots, the intel, the undercover work, the dismantling, and how close some of these attempts came to fruition were alarming and some of the most engaging aspects of the book. Now, having served in the military myself, I can relate to his way of sharing to a certain degree. It's reflective to me of some of the military training that we received and about, you know, public displays of affection. You know, basically, you're always supposed to, you know, have a military bearing. Mm -hmm. And it seems in telling his stories, he maintained his military bearing. Now, that does not mean there were not accounts of situations in which he expressed sorrow and despair, such as in the accounts of 9-11 and his reactions, but the accounts were structured. Mm -hmm. And And the accounts give more matter of fact than an emotional and sensitive and personal 
reflection. Right. What created great sentiment for me? Well, more specifically, a hint of frustration was the attention to detail in this book. Yes, yes. (laughs) Which some readers can appreciate. But for me, in this instance, it was like beating a dead horse. When I began reading, I thought in chapter one, City Kid, why do we need to know about Sister Anthanasius and her mustache and her wooden bat or Ray Ray's home address and every single person that lived in the building that included Mo Bernstein, who owned a candy store and the Kajandas from Norway and the Waters family and the Kaleas, an Italian family and their two sons that both fought in World War II and flew B-24s and that Trigger beat up Squeaky and Poochie intervened by yelling and Trigger killed Poochie and about all the childhood games he played like kick the can, stick ball, punch ball, Johnny Ride a Pony and Salugi. What's Salugi? Well, you know what? (laughs) Those were some of the challenging areas, but sometimes I feel that's the way he was trying to be personal. You know? Uh, What do you think? Maybe, maybe, but... I was ready to stick some bamboo shoots under my fingernails. But (laughs) then then as I continued to read, I learned he was a Marine and the attention to detail was explanatory. So being military myself and you too, Shay, now I understand why on earth he used so much detail. But the fact that he was holding a red Sharpie in his left hand while drawing, drawing triangles on a white flip chart to talk through the future or reorganization of NYPD, I just start feeling some type of way. So something else that evoked sentiment in me was the number of fatalities that he mentioned, which include so many unarmed killings by police officers. He named many victims, and those are just the ones he he included in his book. But chapter 13, oh my goodness, he named the victims. He detailed the play-by-play of case recordings. He identified that he stood up and said, hey, that's an unjustified shooting. And he took a lot of flack for that, which was commendable on his part. The police victims that were killed, he talked about the in excess of two thousand murders in a one year period. It was it was a tremendous achievement that by the time Kelly second term had ended, he was able to identify with the comparative analysis that his efforts, his authoritarian style, his connections, his network saved 9,500 New Yorkers lives over the last 12 years with no additional terrorist attacks. So I hand salute him. He did he did a great job. Oh, why don't you go ahead and talk about the community confidence that um, Kelly worked to restore? Oh, well, Kelly, he knows he was a hard charger. The book details he was a hard charger. Kelly was commissioned and charged by Commissioner Brown to orchestrate this full-blown analysis of what the city needed to improve public safety. So he partnered with the Office of Management and Analysis and Planning, which he had previously worked in, and they compiled a report identifying that NYPD needed 5,000 more officers for a community policing effort called Safe Streets, Safe Cities. Unfortunately, He didn't get to see the full fruits of his labor because safe street, safe cities didn't materialize until after he and Mayor Dinkins had left. But upon his return as New York commissioner in 2002, Kelly arrived with a plan and his plan was to address counterterrorism, crime fighting and community relations. Everything Kelly did was in the interest of keeping New York safe. He solicited high profile and critical thinkers to serve in his top positions, like you stated, and to ensure the safety of the city. Although extremely controversial, he implemented what he called street inquiries. Do you remember that stop and frisk deal that was all? Yes, yes. Thanks, Ray Kelly. But critics called it stop and frisk. Kelly believed to usher NYPD into modern policing, you have to be proactive and get police engaged. He also created Operation Impact, where He took the police academy graduates and sent them in large numbers into high crime areas with experienced supervisors. Recruits brought their high energy and vitality and got the chance to learn and do police work. They learned their beats. Kelly also implemented Operation Crew Cut. He formed a Muslim advisory council and a demographics unit to familiarize themselves with people in the community and to increase diversity awareness. Kelly never seemed to run out of effective and impactful ideas. I really think you covered that area really well. I agree with you. He was very result-driven, and I think that's how he led the charge. So let's go ahead and talk about 
profound findings in the book. What I found to be exceptional and profound in vigilance is one of Kelly's assertions. And what Kelly said was, if the police are going to be part of the people, not just among the people or on top of the people, we need to engage productively with everyone. So that's one of his in mantras, I should say, that he lived by. Another assertion by Kelly was, we have to take the challenges of the moment and mold them into long-lasting improvements. That's how we as police get better. That's how we as Americans build a better society for everyone. So these two statements really stuck out with me. I just thought they were very profound and some excellent words to model after. One thing that I found profound was Kelly admitted that, you know, everything he learned about leadership, he learned in the Marine Corps. He stated that leaders make sure their troops eat first and that they eat last. And this reminded me of a personal experience with Brigadier General Paul E. Owen, Commander and Division Engineer of the Southwestern Division of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. November 6, 2018, just last year, we had a Veterans Day breakfast, and he was one of the guests at the event. After everyone made their speeches, breakfast was served. As I walked around touching base with different attending veterans, I looked over and Brigadier General Owen had assumed a position in the chow line and was handing out scrambled eggs and breakfast burritos instead of sitting down eating himself. It was remarkable to watch. And he is true. Leaders are humble servants. And I found that Kelly was definitely a servant, rather authoritarian, participative, collaborative, democratic, or laissez-faire. He had servitude in his heart. And another thing I found to be profound was in between his local government uh, and federal and private time, Kelly found time to serve as the chairman of the New York State Athletic Commission. In a short time, he cleaned up the double dealing and corruption And what I liked most is that Kelly enlisted the boxers to report injuries by calling a number so that nobody could take advantage of them. So probably if I knew anybody in New York, I bet you they could say he was one of those guys you had to love, but he could poke you if he needed to. (laughs) Let's let's move to close what I thought about vigilance as a whole. It, It was a good read. There there were moments where the information was packed for sure. But in pushing through, I enjoy reading the book. While I did not get a full picture of the personal side of Kelly, I mean, I don't feel like I know him any more in a personal way than I did before I started the book, but I did certainly get a sense of the professional side of Kelly. Uh, Kelly is truly gifted, committed, and dedicated to his duties in his country. And his accomplishments, I mean, he had a business degree, a law degree, a master's in public administration. He was the commissioner of New York twice. He was the undersecretary of treasury for enforcement for Clinton. Um, He worked on the 911 rapid response team. Um, And then his his influence on the Freedom Tower. I mean, it it just can't be overlooked. He, He definitely was a gifted individual. So if I was to rate vigilance, I would rate it at a four. And I would definitely say it's a very good and compelling read. Very nice. And my final review, Kelly prepared an extensive compilation of his life accomplishments. His memoir is very telling that he is task oriented and task driven. Kelly has proven to be stellar in his efforts of civil service and a humanitarian. I was happy to learn that after his second 12 year commitment as NYPD commissioner, he took Victoria on a vacation. Yeah. <laughs> Kelly had <laughs> Kelly had an unrelenting drive to physically be in the midst of tumultuous public safety events. And if he wasn't, he would take a mental road trip there. In vigilance, the storyline embarked on some very serious issues that continue to plague the nation today. It is evident that Kelly wrestles with resolving racial injustices as he did highlight numerous poor actions on behalf of some of the officers. And he did call a spade a spade throughout the book regarding unjustified shootings. Kelly clamored for diversity in the community and within the department. He was the first commissioner to try and increase NYPD's African-American employment rate from 11.5 to mirror the African-American rate in New York City. In vigilance, 
Kelly took a few political stabs at some individuals in the book like Judge Shenland and the lame duck mayor Giuliani. Nevertheless, I found the navigation of the topic had some hard stops where smooth transitions were not detected. Vigilance was full of research and quantifiers. For anyone that would like to know the climate of New York politics, this is an ideal book. You would definitely learn what he loved to do. Kelly provided many, 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 many details to paint clear pictures for any reader. In this, I rate Vigilance a compelling read with four stars. This concludes our literature review of Vigilance by Ray Kelly. We hope you enjoyed today's podcast and found it to be a useful recommendation. Please stand by for the next episode of The Doctor's Corner. Remember to listen, like, and subscribe. Thank you, everyone.